Hey guys, it's Eric from Open Source Medicine. I wanted to go over with you guys today how to train cricothyrotomy using a 3D printed crike. Uh, I'm following the technique that Scott Weingard from EMCrit shows. It's super easy, super cool. I'll post a link in the description to his website, which goes over all of this as well and has a lot of extra resources. I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> I started training crikes after I botched my first attempt years ago. Um, it was a horrible mess, and I realized that you can't just read about it and think you know about it. You actually have to practice it. So since then, I've practiced it maybe once a month. Um, what you need for this is some kind of a blade. In the real world, you'd like a 10 or 11 blade, but you know I'm using an X-Acto. You need 4x4s, a plastic baggie or a biohazard bag, uh, packing tape like this, or uh, duct tape, anything that'll give you a nice pop when you go through the cricothyroid membrane, and then your bougie and your endotracheal tube or a trach tube if you have it. You can always use a rigid, like or not a rigid, but an intubating stylet as well, although that will be a little stiffer than using a bougie. Okay, so here's how you do this procedure. I'll, I'll show you guys how to do this, and then I'll spend a few minutes afterwards talking about some alternative ways to practice this, um, some pearls I've learned from doing cracks myself that you can practice when you're, you know, training for it. Okay, so uh, you start by taking the packing tape, making your cricothyroid membrane like this, and kind of put your finger on it, kind of make it a little divity like that, so it feels nice and like a cricothyroid. Then you take your 4x4s, and you can do this however you want. I bought this stuff from the dollar store. It's actually really hard to cut, so I'm just going to do a single layer, but you can stack this as deep as you want to simulate like a super thick neck or something like that. Uh, and then you secure it in place with some tape. I can reach it. Yeah, there we go. So now we have a crike with a cricothyroid and sub-Q tissue. The last thing is some skin, and that's where your baggie comes in. You uh, slide it inside the baggie, and now you have a crike trainer that has been validated to teach you the motor memory skills so that you can perform uh, in a high-stress situation. All right, so here's how you do this. You always stand on the side of the patient uh, that is your dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, you stand on the patient's, the right side of the bed. If you're left-handed like me, you stand on the left side of the bed. Um, and the reason for that is that your non-dominant hand is gonna be stabilizing the cartilage uh, superior to the cricothyroid where the patient's head is right here. Um, while your dominant hand is working below doing the incision in the work. So when you start, you're going to, uh, you're actually gonna start palpating for the cricothyroid from the sternal notch, working your way up. That's been the way that's been shown to be the easiest to find on difficult to palpate patients. Um, a lot of people wanna go in straight for the cricothyroid, but that's, and that's fine, um, but you might miss it if it's a difficult neck, whereas below you might find some landmarks. And so, um, that's, that's how I do it anyways. So you palpate up with your dominant hand until you feel the cricothyroid. Once you feel the cricothyroid, with these two fingers, you stabilize the trachea on either side at its widest point with your pointer finger going into the cricothyroid membrane. Then you take your scalpel, and what you're going to want to do is do, I'd say, at least a two-inch incision. If you can't really feel the anatomy, make your incision much longer. Uh, I've seen some sources say you can even start at the sternal notch and, you know, cut a really big one open if it's that desperate of a situation. Uh, as long as you stay midline, there's very little of hyper important structures to hit. So you're pretty safe doing that. <clears throat> so one of the things is with my first one was I cut myself when I was uh, going in because I had my, my blade and my finger in the field at the same time, which is how they used to teach it. But I've noticed a lot of people, including Scott Weigard from EM Crit, now advocating that you remove your finger whenever the blade's on the field. And that's how I've been practicing it. So it was nice to see some validation there. Um, the way you do this is, and this is why it's important to practice. This is, so when your blade goes onto the field, your finger retracts. When the blade goes away, your finger goes back in. This is especially important once you puncture the cricothyroid. The temptation is while your blade's in there to start feeling, but don't do that. That's where I cut my finger. Okay, so if you can palpate your landmarks, you go right above the cricothyroid and you make a nice aggressive incision. Don't be afraid about pushing. Really get in there and cut and do like a two-inch incision. Uh, 
once you've made your initial incision, you can go and then repalpate. If you don't really feel cricothyroid or you think you need to go a little deeper, you can uh, cut a little more, which is what I'm going to do because this these 4 by 4 suck. All right. And then go in and repalpate again. This is where you can also... Uh, I don't use hemostats. I'll talk about more why later. Uh, but I, I go in here and you can bluntly dissect with your other finger like this. Again, this is an aggressive procedure. You'd be surprised how much force is needed, especially to get your finger into the cricothyroid. So you can use your fingers like this to bluntly dissect and then repalpate until you feel like you're pretty good. Okay. Once you feel like you're pretty good and you're on top of the cricothyroid, then uh, your first incision was horizontal. Your next one, or vertical, your next incision is going to be horizontal. So you, you start with the blade turned away from you, with the sharp point turned away from you. You go perpendicular to the cricothyroid. You go all the way in, puncture, and then hit the posterior wall of the trachea. When you do that, then you move the blade as far away from you as it can until it hits the lateral wall of the trachea. Then you flip the blade 180 degrees until it's coming towards you. And then you bring the blade all the way towards you. So that makes a, a horizontal incision all the way through the cricothyroid. Notice my my finger is not in there messing around while it's doing that. The blade comes out, and then your finger goes in. And at this stage, you might have to, uh, this is another aggressive point. In real people, you have to push through tissue and all kinds of other stuff sometimes. You, your goal is to put your finger to the floor or the posterior wall of the uh, trachea. If you can't do that, it can, like your finger's too big or something, you can either enlarge in your incision if, it, if you were too, not aggressive enough, or if it's just your finger is too big, you can use your pinky or something like that too. That's totally acceptable. But your finger should go to the posterior wall of the trachea. And the reason for that is now you take either your uh, intubating stylet, if you don't have a bougie, or your bougie, and what you want to do is go behind the your finger, touching the pad of your finger, going along the pad of the finger with the bougie and sliding it in into the trachea. And the thing about the, and you can retract your finger a little bit as you put the bougie in. And what's nice about this is this is 100% confirmation that you're going in the right space and you're not tunneling sub Q or something with the bougie. You can feel with the pad of your finger the bougie going into the trachea. It's a nice, it's like doing end tidal capnography on an intubation. It's, it's like that near 100% highly sensitive uh, test you can do to make sure it's going in the right spot. Once it's in there, you hit the carina or something like that, you're good, you can stop, and uh, you advance your tube. Now, one thing I'll tell you when you're advancing your tube, and let me see if I can get up close to this. When you're advancing your tube, Sometimes the tip of the tube will get caught on the cartilage right there. So as you're going in, if it gets caught, like it's getting caught right now, just push it in a little bit as you're going in. A lot of uh, a lot of times, like people just will be so amped up, they'll be trying to shove this thing in and won't go in. It's just because it keeps getting caught on the lip there. So just give it a little bump. It'll slide in there. And then what you want to do is just slide that tube in just until the balloon disappears. You don't want to advance it any further than that or you'll right main it or something. Okay. You take your bougie out. Inflate your tube and start ventilating. Super easy. That's it. Now, let's move on to some tips and tricks and stuff like that. Number one, um, when you're making these incisions, uh, practice not using your eyeballs after the first incision. What I mean by that is you can use your eyes to see where your first incision goes, but after that, train this finger to do it entirely by feel. This may be a super messy field. There may be a ton of blood. Um, it's a tight space, and you shouldn't be relying on your eyes to visualize the cricothyroid. It should be a total feel, not only to get to the cricothyroid, but you should teach your fingers how to bluntly dissect tissue. That brings me to my second point. A lot of people ask about hemostats or some kind of dissecting forceps or something. Totally fine if you if you want to do that. I know a lot of anesthetists like doing that because they see ENT surgeons doing it during tracheostomies. Uh, I personally don't because I've never found it to be necessary. I also don't train that way because um, I like using the most basic tools that I know will be pretty much universally available anywhere. I don't want to train for a procedure and then when I have to do it, maybe find out that I don't have all the tools I need. So I try to avoid the hemostats. Um, and the last reason is because the more tools you have, that adds potentially extra steps of picking, picking things up, putting things down, finding where things are that might slide off the patient's chest or something. So again, I just try to keep it as simple as possible. But if you do like uh, 
uh, using hemostats, and I know a ton of people who've done this, a ton that use hemostats. I'm not knocking it. My only recommendation is that you practice with it so you get really good at it. The other thing is securing the airway. Um, people try to tape these things, which might be fine, but in my experience, when I had to do these, it was with trauma. And, uh, well, one was with trauma, one wasn't. Um, but they both, I wasn't able, with knee, uh, with either of them, I wasn't able to secure tape to the airway. One because it was a surgical site, the other one because um, uh, there was just a ton of blood everywhere. So what I would recommend as an added bonus to this is to learn how to suture uh, the tube in place, kind of like a chest tube or something like that. Use two different points. Uh, it's easy to suture onto the uh, four by fours here um, and then wrap, you know, do that tie like you do with a chest tube and that'll lock it in place. And it's especially important if you're thinking about transporting this patient, flying them out or something like that, or doing some kind of medevac. Um, or if you're not going to be in control of the airway or able to access it, access it easily. Um, I think it's a really good skill to practice. So last thing I'll say about uh, add-ons for practicing, uh, on, and I'll include a link to this as well in uh, the description, you can actually buy uh, a Kevlar neck protector that you can put on and then place this over the, so you have the Kevlar and then you place this over the Kevlar on someone's neck so you can get that extra bit of realism in doing a crike. I do not do this on someone's neck without the Kevlar, but if you have the Kevlar, it makes it relatively safe. Um, and it's a great way to add some realism um, to this to, to really get a feel for it. Um, and they're pretty cheap. They're like 30 bucks. So that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. If you guys have any questions, hit me up.